Welcome inspired viewers to Science and Spirituality on Supreme Master Television. On this edition we will discuss a fascinating topic, Biological Creation and Evolution with British Molecular Biochemist Dr. John Joe McFadden. Dr. McFadden has studied human genetic and infectious diseases. Since 2001 he has been teaching molecular genetics at the University of Surrey in England. Over the years, he has researched the genetics of a wide range of microbes and has done computer modeling of evolution. In his international best-selling book, Quantum Evolution, How Physics' Weirdest Theory Explains Life's Biggest Mystery, Dr. McFadden explores the role of quantum mechanics in life, evolution and consciousness. Modern biology has challenges with explaining the origin of life on Earth. One of the reasons is that it looks at the question purely from a biological perspective. Can quantum physics help us find answers? Let's find out from our guest today. What is the current view of molecular biology on origin of life on Earth? The current view is that life originated here on Earth from a chemical start. And in the primordial soup idea, uh, chemicals randomly uh, came together and over maybe millions of years they collected together to form simple chemicals and one of these simple chemicals had the extraordinary property of being able to self-replicate. Okay, mm. but recently there are some uh, discoveries, first uh, that uh, there is uh, water on Mars, there are yep. some planetary systems which are very similar to ours mm -hmm. and also uh, there was several years ago uh, the discovery that meteors can also contain amino acids or some organic yeah. uh, and they are even older than our planetary systems. Yeah. How do you view <coughs> these discoveries? Uh, um, I think it helps the idea of the primordial soup mm -hmm. um, because one of the many problems with the primordial soup idea is where did the organic molecules come from? Mm -hmm. Now organic material doesn't mean it's from a living system. What it means is carbon-based chemicals. But most scientists don't believe that um, living organisms came in from space, although, uh, for instance, uh, the physicist Paul Davis believes that life may have originated on Mars, which is perfectly okay, but if it originated on Mars, you've still got the same problems of where does the primordial soup come from. So although moving it to Mars helps by maybe starting things a little bit earlier, it doesn't really solve the fundamental problems. How do you make a self-replicator? How do you get from a self-replicator to a cell? There were some trials to reproduce that primordial soup in the uh, laboratory, like for example Stanley Miller experiments or mm -hmm. other experiments. Uh, so how far scientists are from synthesizing uh, artificial life in a laboratory uh, to produce something like RNA or uh, something that re uh, replicates in a similar uh, way as living species? Well, um, the best guess for the kind of simple chemicals that might have been the self-replicators are um, chemicals called RNA molecules. Right. This they are much simpler, think. so it's natural that yeah, uh, they've started from Yes, it. exactly. So they may have some simple properties. Now, people have tried now for a long time, two decades really, to make RNA molecules that can self-replicate. And so far they've been unsuccessful. RNA f is a difficult molecule to make, and there may be a self-replicating uh, RNA out there in terms of all the possible RNA molecules that you can make. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one of them may be able to self-replicate. It's probably an astronomical number and there's just not enough room on this Earth to make that number of molecules. So, so what is your view actually? Could it happen by chance? Is the uh, universe big enough and old enough in order to make that chance because we, well, we, there were calculations that it's not, mm. so you need many universes. Exactly, well that's, that's where quantum mechanics may come to the rescue. Quantum mechanics could provide an explanation for the origin of life. And the reason for that is that if a system is quantum mechanical, it kind of lives in the quantum multiverse, which means that a small number of molecules can explore a vast number of possible structures. Mm -hmm. So if the origin of life took place in a quantum mechanical state, then you are not limited by the size of this small pond on the early Earth. In other words, the quantum state can realize all omnipresent possibilities at once, while a random trial and error path of development for a life replicator would take an enormous amount of time, longer than the age of our universe. Uh, 
and I think that could be part of the explanation at least for how you overcome this problem of the huge improbability of life. Life has evolved in various directions. Mainstream modern biology has adapted Charles Darwin's theory of adaptation by natural selection, which says populations of an organism will naturally produce individuals that are increasingly better adapted to their environment over time as a fundamental mechanism of evolution. Once you have self-replication, then Darwinian natural selection kicks in. Once you have Darwinian natural selection and a source of variation, you will get evolution. So once you have self-replication, the problem is solved, really. There's still lots of difficult steps, how you get, go from a self-replicating molecule to a cell enclosed within a membrane and all this kind of stuff, okay. but they're nothing compared to the difficulty of making a self-replicator. And that seems to be the key hard problem in biology. How do you generate a self-replicator? And if you ask it today, what is the simplest self-replicator that exists on this planet? Then the answer is, it's a bacterial cell. And a bacterial cell is extraordinarily complicated. It has maybe 3,000 genes. It has complex structure, membranes, proteins and amino acids and sugars and all cell walls. All of these structures are necessary to self-replicate on this planet today. Random forces, they're not good at making complexity. So we need another way of making complexity. And I think quantum mechanics may provide that. After these short messages, we will have more from our engaging interview with Dr. McFadden. Please stay tuned to Supreme Master Television. Welcome back to Science and Spirituality on Supreme Master Television. Our guest today, British molecular biochemist Dr. John Joe McFadden, realized more than a decade ago that quantum interference can help in understanding the fundamental aspects of life creation. Dr. McFadden now discusses the revolution between Darwin's theory of natural selection and adaptation and the ideas in his book on evolution. Let's talk about the evolution. You wrote a book about quantum evolution. How would you compare your quantum evolution uh, uh, with the Darwin's uh, natural selection okay. and adaptation theory? Well, first of all, it's an addition to Darwin's natural selection. Where quantum evolution comes in uh, is in certain uh, situations where Darwinian natural selection doesn't seem to work. You take a bacterial cell in terms, uh, in this case, E. coli, and uh, you grow it on a medium in which it can't grow because it can't make the enzyme required to break down the sugar that's present in this medium, okay? okay. The sugars, say, can be glucose. But yet, if you leave the E. coli on the plate for long enough, little colonies appear. And they appear at quite a high frequency. And that high frequency is hard to explain by Darwinian natural selection because if you look at the frequency of this mutation without glucose being present, it's very low. But when glucose is present, this frequency goes up maybe a thousand-fold. And this is very difficult to explain, that the cell somehow can look at its environment and see, OK, what I need to do is mutate this gene. And if I mutate this gene, then uh, I will be able to grow and replicate. Now, how we understand mutation is mutations occur randomly. And it doesn't make any difference whether you've got a sugar there that will allow you to grow or not. The mutation should occur at the same rate. But in this situation, it doesn't. And there's no mechanism in normal cell biology that explains how you can increase a mutation rate by having a particular environment present. There's no way back mm -hmm. from the environment to the genome. Mm -hmm. This is one of the central dogmas of, of molecular biology, that information doesn't go back to the genome. It um, has to occur random, and then yep. uh, nature selects and then one. Natural right. Mutations occur randomly. Natural selection provides the direction of evolution. Mm -hmm. And there's no question that that is mostly right. Now, given that, if you ask a physicist, how do you understand single molecules? They won't say chemistry. They'll say quantum mechanics. So that points to living cells being controlled by quantum mechanics. And if you have living cells being controlled by quantum mechanics within a single DNA molecule, 
then you can have unusual phenomena going on, such as quantum superposition and quantum coherence. And there may lie the solution to this problem. Okay, so how do you see, see the solution to this problem in terms of quantum mechanics? Here you have a, a warm temperature Absolutely. of Absolutely. the so body. Mm. So uh, how can coherence be preserved? It's still um, a, a difficult problem because, as, as you say, normally you wouldn't expect quantum mechanical effects in hot, wet systems. Mm -hmm. The chemical properties of a bottle of benzene on the table will depend on that quantum mechanical effect that the three electrons are spread across six carbon atoms. So if you look at individual molecules, they always behave quantum mechanically. So what we have to do is take that into account when we look at the positions of protons along the DNA code. And what that will do is will allow protons to be you, in multiple you, you, positions. You, you, the DNA double helix is held together by what's called a hydrogen bond, right. which is a bond so, between a hydrogen ion, a proton. So you change chemistry by fluctuating of its hydrogen ions. Essentially, the DNA is actually like a scaffold, and the scaffold is holding protons. Those protons determine the DNA code. So the code is written in the position of protons. Yes. So positions of protons is quantum mechanical. So protons can be in two places at once. This is mm -hmm. what we know from quantum mechanics. And what this allows DNA to do is it allows DNA to code for two different codes at once. Now, what this will allow the system will, to do when we come back to the E. coli is the DNA can be in a superposition, using the quantum mechanical term, of different genetic codes. But the problem is that uh, this non-locality that you are basically invoking, that. Uh, you have environment, like yeah. this sugar you mentioned, and mm, that is, uh, finds some way to coherently interfere with the DNA code, which is deep mm -hmm. into the uh, warm body of this mm, bacteria. Yeah. Can, yeah. How the, can you envision that? So actually what I'm claiming is that the measurement is made by the possibility that one of the states of the DNA allows replication of the cell. And in a sense, then that possibility of the cell replicating performs the measurement on the DNA to allow it to crash out of the quantum coherence superposition and become a classical state, a replicating cell that now has that mutation. Please join us next Monday for part two of our interview with Dr. John Joe McFadden on science and spirituality. Thank you, Cherish viewers, for your company on our program today. Coming up next is Words of Wisdom after Noteworthy News. May you have a blessed week ahead. For more details, please visit www.suprememastertv.com forward slash ss.